Welcome, everyone. It is so great to see you this evening. As you come into this Zoom space, if you are able to mute yourself, that would be helpful. Otherwise, I will find your mute button and make it happen. <laughs> We're going to have a time for discussion and questions and answers. Uh, this tonight is about community. And so the ability to um, get to know Ashley, which is why we're all here, and the ability to um, hear from all of you is what we're going after this evening. So as I admit folks into the Zoom room, it would be fabulous if each of you that have the ability to type into the chat would introduce yourself, say your name and um, maybe where you're located, maybe why you decided to join tonight, use the chat room uh, as a way for us to get to know you and to get to know each other would be great. So again, welcome, and we'll get started here in a few moments as more people come into the Zoom. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I feel like we should have a little bit of dancing music in the background or something. <laughs> Everyone's doing a great job of muting themselves as they arrive. Great, I see people from Hillsboro, Mevin, Hillsboro, Hillsboro in the house tonight. This is great. I'm letting folks in as they arrive. It's good to be together on this somewhat chilly winter evening. Oh, many from Esther Drive. Hi, friends. Great. Oh, excited to have a climate candidate with a climate research background. Hi, Melanie. Welcome. And Chris from Effland. If your Zoom is unstable, you'll be on and off. That's okay. And you can call in on your phone too, but we are planning on using the chat space to get our questions into the queue. And once we begin, I will go through some housekeeping um, opportunities of how we're gonna make this work. More folks are joining, wonderful, great. I see friends, I see family. I'm so glad y'all are here. For those of you that are just arriving, folks are putting their name and their location into the chat box. Um, maybe a reason why you're joining us this evening, uh, an opportunity to get to meet a congressional candidate, which is super exciting. We've got scientists in the room. We've got friends. We've got family from all over the place. So please do get comfortable with the chat box. If you're new to Zoom, and maybe this is the first time you've used Zoom, I highly kind of doubt that <laughs> in this age of pandemic, but I'm willing to believe that there are people out there that want to get online and meet Ashley Ward, who maybe has never been in a Zoom room. And you will find your chat feature down on the bottom of your toolbar of this video space. Um, also fun, you can click on that chat box and type into the chat. Uh, which is great. Folks from Chapel Hill and Mebbin arriving from Durham. Um, also fun to look at the participants list. I love getting to know everyone in the chat with their names and locations. And during throughout the meeting, you can click on the participants and the different people will show up um, for names there as well. Great, yay, family in the house, Charlottesville, Virginia even. Um, we understand, of course, that this is not just a North Carolina seat for Congress. This is a national role that Ashley uh, will be playing uh, in this seat of North Carolina District 6. So with that said, we want to be um, sensitive to your time. We're so grateful that you're all here to join us, and we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Susanna Tuttle, and I am so grateful to have the opportunity to introduce my friend and faithful colleague, Dr. Ashley Ward to all of you. Many of you might have met her in whatever area that the walk of life 
brings you <laughs> as a friend, as a family member, as a colleague. Um, I think it probably came as a bit of surprise to all of us that all of a sudden Ashley said, you know what, it's my turn to run for Congress. I am being called. I feel the call. I feel the call. I know the work and we need something different. So let's do different. Um, and as a person who spends all of my time professionally and personally uh, seeking the truth and speaking the truth, I too know that this is Ashley's time to represent our beautiful district of District 6, formerly District 4. So many of you are familiar, of course, with our longstanding, incredible representative, David Price. Um, and with the new mapping and redistricting that's taking place, we've been given a new number. So that in itself is something to educate, inspire, and mobilize people around that uh, the more populated areas of Chapel Hill and Durham and Cary are now in District 6, as well as the counties of Orange and Durham and the rural uh, brothers and sisters that we have all around our district. Um, we're actually a stronger district, I think, together. And this is why it's even more important that we have the very best person representing us here in North Carolina and on the national and world stage. So with no further ado, um, I'll come back and remind everyone how to use the chat to ask questions. Um, and we're gonna go through some priority areas, but first and foremost, you're not here to hear me speak. You're here to hear Dr. Ashley Ward. So turning it over to you, Ashley. Thank you so much. I, I don't know how I can follow such a great, <laughs> Susanna is the best MC. So um, thank you all for coming. It is really wonderful to see so many people uh, signed up for this event tonight. And, um, you know, it's humbling. And I just so very much appreciate you taking, uh, you know, a little bit of your time after the end of your workday to get to know me better and learn more about me as a candidate. And so I can't thank you enough. Um, one of the things we uh, thought we'd just kick it off with tonight, many of you may have seen, but it's just a short two minute little intro video for those of you who have not seen it. Um, we're just gonna play this quick video and then we'll get right to it and can talk a little bit about these priority areas. Um, to be different, then we have to do different. As a scientist, I've been on the front lines fighting against climate change and overburdened and rural and suffering communities, helping them find solutions to extreme climate. But what I've seen is that often policies that seem wonderful on paper are actually difficult in practice. If we're going to solve large and complicated issues and do right by our communities, we need to do different. That's why I'm running for Congress. I'm not a politician, but I'm doing it because I love and I know our district. My family has lived here for generations. Sharecroppers who moved to Durham to work in the tobacco factories. As a kid, I worked in tobacco fields too, but public education gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. First through the community college, then at 30 years old with two small children, I entered UNC Chapel Hill. I got my bachelor's, then I got my master's, then my PhD, and I started working for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, here in the Carolinas. I've spent my life with people from all walks, from tobacco farm hands to university professors. So I know that everybody needs to be heard and respected by their leaders. And I also know how our biggest and thorniest issues aren't abstract problems. They're real to us. Corporations and billionaires paying their fair share mean my family's small business stops paying larger portions in taxes than Amazon. Improving our education system, which changed my life, mean my kids can have a better future. And fighting climate change? Well, that's been my professional mission in life. So here's my radical idea. Let's choose to have a representative with deep roots in this district a future in this district, 
and who's ready to listen to you, not to mention the only climate expert in Congress. And I think that would be pretty different. Okay, so um, am I muted? I don't think I am, Susanna. Okay. <laughs> no, you are not. And I was like, wow. I just, every time I see that video, it just is incredibly inspiring. So any words you'd like to share? And then we'd love to go through the priority issues. I mean, when you close that video and you say, the, not to mention the only climate expert in Congress, and that would be something different, that just gets me every time. So <laughs> thank you for that. Well, you know, I think what I would say, and, I, you know, it's been a topic of conversation a lot recently. And folks have often thought about climate change as a single issue and someone like me as a single issue candidate. And I actually think that couldn't be further from the truth. We live in this environment. Uh, this is the place and the only place we inhabit. And so an environment that is changing in the way that our environment is changing has profound consequences for all of us. What businesses do you think are impacted when there is a climate crisis? Small businesses who really struggle to, uh, you know, they're, they're really impacted by supply chain issues and labor issues and any damage to their assets. And, um, and so it's very hard to recover. And many of the small towns that really get hit in North Carolina, for example, by hurricanes or flash flooding or any of these other events, sometimes they shutter their doors and they're never able to open again. And so while that doesn't seem, you know, that's a small business uh, issue, that's a climate issue too. And housing, housing is a massive issue in this district and everywhere. Um, our housing issues and affordable energy, um, they are all part of the climate change story also when it comes to affordable energy. I could go on and on and on, right, about every aspect of our lives, not to mention my own passion, which is the health impacts of our changing environment. Um, so I think one of the things I would say is when I say and the only climate expert in Congress um, is to say, uh, I invite you to, to uh, think about folks who work in climate, not just a single issue, but holistic, right? Ecological view of everything that connects people with their environment and all of the impacts that that, um, that, that brings. And so uh, that would be part of, part of one of my big messages that I hope all of you take away tonight is we have a lot of, pro there's a lot of priority areas for a lot of folks and it would be impossible to list them all on one slide, right? <laughs> a lot of issues people care about. Um, and you know, I have worked so long in the field, I don't see how any of these things are disconnected from one another. I think they are all part of uh, the world that we live in, both the one that we've created and the natural world that we live in. Wonderful, thank you for that. And as you were speaking, Ashley, I was just putting some directions into the chat about asking questions. So as you look at these priority issues that candidate Ashley has laid out as climate change, ethical government, voting rights, affordable health care, small business support, education and workforce development, um, we are ready to uh, discuss all of these, obviously, uh, as she has laid them out as priority issues here on tonight's uh, slide deck, as well as on her website. I'm also taking some of the questions that are coming in already and putting them into the queue. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and if there is a question that you have that is not on this slide, obviously <laughs> members of Congress get asked everything above and beyond the sun. Um, and so this is also a time for you to get to know Ashley and her perspectives on really anything that you have questions about. And I've learned from my many years of advocacy that um, sometimes the person that you're asking does not know the answer and that's okay too. And so we're going to use tonight as the 
time to get to know each other as community, as members of the district and beyond, as we mentioned. Um, Congress obviously is a, is a federal uh, role and responsibility. And so um, this really is a national campaign as well. And um, I will come in uh, at any time and try to do some moderation in the in the ways that I do with love and compassion. Um, we also want to make sure that this isn't a time where necessarily you're as much sharing your ideas and pontificating on what your idea of the world is. If that's the case, uh, we want to hear that in a, a more intimate setting. But tonight is the night for us to hear from Ashley. And I just wanna again, thank Ashley for making uh, this kind of accessibility um, for, for those of us that just are regular folk that want to get involved and, um, and understand and engage with the people uh, that will then go to serve on our behalf. So um, with that, I am seeing some questions in the chat. And um, as I mentioned, I'll just go over uh, the housekeeping piece one more time that I did put in. We're gonna, um, we are going to open the Q&A portion live. If you would like for me to ask your question, please drop it in the chat if you'd like for me to ask it. So I'm gonna start asking some of these questions um, that have already been dropped in. And if you would like to ask a question directly uh, with your own voice, I will invite you to unmute to speak at the correct time. Um, and to do that, just drop your name in the chat and then I will call on you. So this will be fun. It, sh it should always be fun. So um, I am going to start in the priority issue areas and then we'll circle back to the questions that have come in um, with other issue areas. Uh, Ed Hammond has asked, how do we get ethical health care? How do we define equitable care? So how do we get ethical health care and how do we define equitable care? That is such an excellent uh, question. Uh First of all, I should say first and foremost that uh, I have worked many years in the public health space, um, primarily in underserved communities. And my perspective on healthcare is that I am completely baffled that in this country that we do not have affordable, accessible healthcare for everyone. And when we look at the models that other countries provide for us, the data speak for themselves with respect to the things that matter, health outcomes. We look at lower mort mortality rates, um, better preventative care, um, less morbidity. And I think what we're talking about for the US is not, can we do it? It is, are we willing to do it? And until such time as we are willing to do it, have the political willpower to do it, uh, we are going to continue to see vast disparities in not only health outcomes, but also the delivery, of course, related to that, the delivery of healthcare. In fact, in North Carolina, it is stunning to me that there are 30% of our counties who do not have an obstetrician in the county. So, I, you know, I, we have 100 counties in North Carolina. I think we're up to 60 in the 60 range of counties have a, an obstetrician in those counties. So if you are a pregnant woman in Warren County, North Carolina, you get one day a month, an intern comes from Duke to their public health department, and all of the women in Warren County go to the health department on that day for their prenatal care. Now, if you have another child at home that is sick, if you have transportation problems that day, whatever reason, and you can't make it to the clinic on that day, your maternal health care waits until the next month. I can hardly believe I just told you that story and it's a real story, uh, but that is in fact the reality for many women uh, in North Carolina and in fact across the country. And then we wonder why we struggle with um, more ten, more, uh, maternal health outcomes like we do and infant health outcomes like we do. My own work, some of my work has been in uh, heat, ex all of my research has been in heat exposure and my most recent research was on the impact of heat on preterm birth and maternal health. Maternal health is an issue that I really care about a lot. 
Uh, and you really, you see the impact of the inequities in our healthcare system when you, especially in the maternal healthcare space and the infant uh, health, um, health outcome space. And, you know, what we see in North Carolina, for example, is an, a, a significant increase in risk for preterm birth for women exposed to high heat. Now, why is this happening? It's not just because they live in Eastern North Carolina where it's hotter. A lot of these women are exposed to heat through occupational you know, exposure. So they're working in occupations that, uh, you know, either whether it's manufacturing or restaurant work or anything like that, where they're agriculture or labor, where they're exposed to high heat during the day. And then they go home uh, and they can't afford to run their air condition or they live in a house that doesn't have adequate cooling. And so then they never, their bodies are never able to recover overnight. And then they get up and they go to work the next day and so on and so on. And before you know it, that cumulative effect of heat actually has a significant impact on their health. So when we talk about equitable health care and what that means, it, it means fixing that systemically that I just described. It isn't just about, it is definitely about, you know, prescription drug costs and access to health centers. Community health centers is something I strongly advocate for. We are seeing right now the impact of the closure of community, destruction of community health centers and the closure of community health centers all over the country over the last decades, particularly in rural areas. We see it with respect to the opioid crisis, to the mental health crisis, to the COVID outbreak that we just saw, maternal health outcomes, you name it, we see it. It's also related to broadband in rural areas and the ability to be able to do telehealth. So when I said at the top of this that all of these things are connected, I really mean it. I really have that kind of ecological viewpoint. And in order to address these issues like equitable health care, we have to address all of those things I just described. It isn't just one thing. Thank you, Ashley. And we will come back to the issue of healthcare. Obviously, it's on the hearts and minds of all of us, especially during this pandemic and beyond. Um, we are going to move on to the next question from Anya Bach. Um, actually, Anya, <laughs> I said we were going to come back to it. We're just going to go straight back into it. <laughs> Anya Bach, what is your view about a national healthcare system? There are lots of models around the world about how healthcare is handled. You know, uh, you have you know, the French model, for example, which you know, clearly is one of the best healthcare systems in the world, um, and uh, you and that is a system in which there are um, physicians uh, who are in there are multiple insurance companies. Those insurance companies are funded by uh, you know a government healthcare system. Uh, the people can go to whatever physician they want to go to it. You don't see things like, you know, I, the recent study I saw about emergency department wait times and things like that. They're, you know, the same as what we have in the U S uh, and if not better in some cases. So, uh, there's a lot of fear and misinformation that I think, um, has been conveyed about a lot of topics, but particularly about universal health care. Uh, the universal healthcare approach. And I'm a scientist. I'm going to look at the data outcomes. And you just cannot come to any other conclusion when you look at health outcomes, life expectancies, you know, child health, infant health, maternal health, well being, all of these mental health outcomes. We, we are 30th in the world on a lot of these uh, health outcomes. It's amazing. How is that? <laughs> There's no reason for it to be that way. And in my opinion, uh, you know, we need to look at some of these successful models that are delivering healthcare more effectively and efficiently to their populations. And we need to model after what works. Thank you for that as well. Um, not surprisingly, we're going to move on to climate change. Uh, and I love that we started out with healthcare because it's so important as we're spreading the news, uh, the good news of Ashley Ward running for this congressional seat that you are indeed a climate and health 
expert uh, with a specific uh, skill set around environmental data, which I just love. I'm a data geek, and uh, all the data is actually real people's live stories, right? So um, the climate crisis obviously is impacting all of us, uh, and we are in a code red scenario. So Cliff Bellamy has asked, do you believe there is momentum for more cooperation on climate change? I do. I mean, I know I'm sound like a Pollyanna, right? I'm one of these optimistic people uh, who believes there's still time. Uh, but we need to act with urgency. And we need to be bold in our, in our policies and plans to address climate change. Over the last decade of working in this field, you know, I started off working with NOAA. They sent me to rural North and South Carolina 10 years ago to talk about heat exposure, climate change. And I'm the most, the reddest counties, right? North and North and South Carolina. I was terrified. I really was. I, I, I remember I felt almost nauseous when I went to that first engagement because I was so afraid people, I was convinced like someone was going to you know yell at me or I don't know. That's not what happened at all. It was absolutely wonderful. The people there were wonderful. And I say that to say, people know what's happening. It's happening right now. There's no need to convince anybody anymore that climate change is happening. We are living through it in real time. This is not a future state. This is a now state. And so I think even conservatives have moved off of that stance that it's not real, right? Even conservatives have, um, have moved forward to acknowledging that we need to do something about this. Now, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about what that looks like um, and how we address climate change. But I think as far as whether or not there's a uh, will to do something, it wasn't that long ago. We had maybe three, four billion dollar climate events in the country every year. Last year we had 20. At some point, this is just not sustainable anymore to, you know, no matter what, where you fall on the ideological spectrum, there's no denying that something is happening and it's having a major impact, not just on our, our health and well-being, but also economically. Uh, and because of that, yes, I think there is, we are in a moment right now where people are motivated to do something about it. Uh, Climate change doesn't care how you voted in the last election, and it doesn't care how you're going to vote in this election. Uh, these extreme events are extreme for everybody. And I really believe that if we could just get, there's some research that showed that if politicians were talking about climate change differently, that the public would follow. Uh, my colleague at Duke has done a lot of work on climate sort of the psychology around climate change. We have to have leadership on climate change that is willing to take bold action on climate change and to inspire the people in their districts and make the case about why this is in their best interest. I already told you about small businesses, but think about schools that are interrupted. And you know, having that conversation with people in our districts about how climate change is affecting their life today, right now, is how we do that. And you have to have leaders that are willing to be, you know, innovative and also are willing to bring people along with them. My entire career has been getting people at to the table who don't agree with each other. That's what I, that's what I do around this topic. You know, in some cases, it's big ag and oil and gas industry, along with NGOs and state government and federal government and, you know, get all these people at the table together. And somehow we have to communicate with each other, define what the priorities are and lay out our path forward for addressing whatever their community issue is. I have found that people really want to do that. They're willing to roll up their sleeves and get going. They need leadership to do it, though. That is what they're looking for. They have the ideas. Communities know how to fix the problem. They know what their problems are. They know how to solve them. They need 
allies in leadership to help them solve it. And I really think that that's why now is the time. And I think the energy's there. Uh, fantastic. I mean, that hope-filled perspective that we need so desperately and how to bring everyone to the table, because as we know, as you said, this impacts all of us. There's not, no one is exempt. Um, so that's very refreshing. And, and some of you on this call, I am here tonight as a private citizen, as a voter uh, in, in North Carolina District 6. Um, I'm so proud and um, excited to be able to support Ashley's campaign uh, for, for this congressional seat. I, I do believe you are the right person at the right time um, for a long overdue uh, address to uh, the biggest crisis of, humanitarian, of hu humanity of all time. So um, the time is now. Um, some of you know what I do professionally, um, and I do have the opportunity to meet with elected officials, and I do spend time doing climate advocacy day in and day out, and I can't tell you how often it's that leadership that we lack, that it is the very people in places of power and decision making that actually turn on me and say, we need you to lead the conversation because we don't know the answer to the question that you are asking. And what's so amazing about what you just said is the communities do have those answers. We have the solutions and you have been in the field your entire career helping to support those very communities to bring those solutions to light and to collect the information and the data so that you can provide the leadership and write the policies that we need in place. I mean, it's just amazing to me, and I'm sure everyone on this call and everyone listening, the ability to imagine that there would be somebody in Congress that wouldn't have to look outside of them, their own experience to provide the actual very policy that we need right now. We kind of hope that those people are in those places of power. Um, and this is why you are the change that we seek. Um, so flipping the script a little bit, although as everything is connected and as someone who uh, is really doing a lot of work around the education around climate finance, I'm gonna shift over to a different question coming from James Silva. What are your thoughts on defense spending? Hmm. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we just had an enormous nationwide debate about spending on infrastructure and the Build Back Better plan and how and the price tag associated with that uh, proposal. One of the things that surprised me, it shouldn't have, but it did, in the media conversation about that is a week before, maybe a couple of weeks before, we started negotiating uh, in the Senate over the Build Back Better. Um, the defense spending bill passed, which was twice as large as the spending for Build Back Better. But surprisingly, that was not a conversation we had in the media and in our communities. Now, I support the military. I have family that are veterans. Uh, but I think this is a moment where we really need to, we really need to pause and think about our priorities. We have pulled out of the war um, in Afghanistan. Uh, we have a larger military by many times than other countries, every other country down the line. The questions we need to be asking are, how are we spending our money and are we spending it as efficiently and effectively as we could in the ways that have the most impact? I believe that we have a role to play globally, particularly when it comes to, um, well, climate refugees and stabilizing the planet. This is, as all of you have heard, the impact, you know, the military, the U.S. Department of Defense has said that climate change is the number one threat to national security. Uh, and uh, I do believe that we have a role to play in that respect. But I also think that 
we have significant spending that has to be made in, in this country around infrastructure, around smart, effective adaptation, around healthcare, education, broadband. And these are the choices that we're making, right? With our purse. And so I, um, I think I share your concern about the, the, mis the seeming mismatch, the mismatch, right? And what we're seeing in spending. And I would like to see less hand-wringing over the cost to things like infrastructure um, and a willingness to invest as boldly uh, in our infrastructure and in our popular and what's happening here as we are in defense. And if that, and if, you know, I'm going to be honest, if people say, no, I do not believe that we should reduce our defense budget. Okay, then perhaps we match that with our infrastructure budget. Wow, that's that's very thought provoking, and I, I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to to learning more of your perspectives on that. And I know as a researcher, you probably have like a plethora of information that that I mean, how do we even talk about our defense spending budget? Right, it's so astronomical and so um, in some ways unconscionable, and I'll say, say this, this is an I statement for the needs that are out there. And my question, you know, to you and to myself and, and to the world is, um, we call it a defense budget, you know, defense spending, to look inward and really question on what it is that we're defending. And um, we know that democracy is in the state that it is in this country. Um, and, um, you know, how everything is interrelated. Are, are we actually defending um, our relationships with, um, you know, fossil fuel executives so that um, the conversation that we're all having right now and listening to on NPR or wherever we get our news with regards to what's going on, um, you know, with, with Russia and, and hearing about Germany's role and, you know, whether or not, you know, they can have access to Russia's gas. And I mean, there's all this infrastructure. I love that you connected it to infrastructure right away. Um, that really, really spoke to me and, and got my wheels turning and thinking about um, back to the notion of climate finance, if, if, if we could discuss all, if, if, if the fierce urgency of now is to address the climate crisis for, for, you know, all species, not just human species moving forward, and we named all of our financial resources as a kind of climate finance, we already have experts deployed around the world. We've, we're already everywhere, right? And if we had flipped that into a situation to think about infrastructure, global infrastructure for the good, for the common good. Um, I, just... and I think what the only other thing I'll say about military spending is, you know what I don't like to see? I have a friend who just retired from the military. What I don't like to see is um, a lack of investment in our VA system and, and caring for people who, are, who have already served their country. I don't like to know the fact that a majority of our enlisted families are on food stamps because they are not paid enough to be able to go to the grocery store. I don't like to see military families worrying about how they're gonna pay for their kids to go to college. I don't like any of our families seeing how they're gonna pay one worried about how they're going to pay for their kids to go to college. So what I do also see is, and I would love to know the answer. I don't know the answer to this question is how much of those dollars from the department of defense are spent toward contractors uh, for private industry contractors. And are we actually spending that money in the way that is that the way that we intend? I cannot believe the, well, quite frankly, in some cases, the, the water supply systems and our, in some of our um, military bases and the living conditions in some of our military bases, the fact that healthcare, the healthcare system for our veterans is in the shape that it's in, all of these things, right? These are choices that we are making with our purse and our vote 
about how we are prioritizing what's important for us as a society. And like I said, I'm not a person that's against the military, but fine, if we are gonna support the military, I want to see us to support the military. I want to know that the money that we're giving, that enormous astronomical sum of money, it seems crazy that we spend that much money and yet we still have those conditions I just described for the people who serve in our military. That is, that makes no sense. That gives a whole new meaning to supporting the military. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, Russell, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Wiener, Russell Wiener. The question is, the U.S. uses more energy per capita and in total than any other country. Compared to other developed countries, our energy prices are extremely low. At the same time, our building codes are incredibly lax in regard to energy efficiency. How do you intend to keep energy prices low housing costs low, and make progress in these areas environmentally in regard to climate change. I'm going to drop this question back into the top of the chat in case you want to take a look at it, um, Ashley, while you're responding, because that is a deep, deep question. Um, and if you can answer this, you win the prize. <laughs> These are great questions. And please keep your questions coming. Um, we have time. We are going to kind of take a time check at eight o'clock um, to see if folks can stay on. Uh, but we are here, Ashley is here to answer your question. So ask everything, go for it. And now you get this question. So do you want me to read it again? No, I can see it now in the chat. So that's good. Thank you for Perfect. doing it. <laughs> okay, so um, I've already said how I think everything is, is integrated, right? Uh, I think we're at a moment so just a little bit of background. Sorry, I'm gonna, I am going to answer your question, but I'm going to give you my perspective on this uh, issue first. So I work in climate health, but I'm in the resilience and adaptation space. There is a, an uncomfortable truth, and that is, you know, when we think about climate change, there are uh, efforts toward mitigation, which is stopping the warming of the earth and stopping extreme events through things like uh, investing in renewable energy, right? And uh, uh, there is resilience, which is how quickly we bounce back when an event happens. This is really around the, um, you know, the disaster recovery space is a, big, is a big part of that conversation with resilience. And then there is adaptation. And adaptation is changing our environment, the, the built environment, to respond to the reality of what exists, and even in the best case scenarios, what is coming. Even if we mitigate as much as we possibly can, there is still a change. We are still not going to be living in the same environment they are right now. That means that as global temperatures warm, we are really going to see, and they are going to warm even with mitigation. Our idea is to put a ceiling on that, right? But we're here, we're going to go to here. We hope we don't go here, <laughs> we want to go to here. That's gonna require some adaptation on our part because our buildings, as you so rightfully point out, our housing, our energy infrastructure, is not designed, was not built to be part of the environment that we will have. Our roadways, our bridges, um, our sewer systems, our water systems, all of that infrastructure was not built with this reality in mind. So the uncomfortable truth is that we are going to have to invest significantly nationally in major adaptation, huge adaptation infrastructure projects. That is just a conversation no one else wants to have, but everybody I know who actually works in this space is having this conversation. And I wanna be clear here, I'm not talking only about forced migration. I'm not talking only about relocating communities. That's part of it. but. Communities on the coast aren't the only ones having a problem. You relocate them from the coast inland, they have climate change issues too. 
Um, so it's not as if they're escaping climate change by just making them move from their coastal community. We're talking about moving them inland where there's drought, wildfires, uh, heavy precipitation and flash flooding events. Everywhere has to invest in adaptation. And so that means that we have to first invest in adaptation technologies, which is how we get to your question, right? Which is how do we intend to keep prices low, housing costs low, make progress in these things? We do that by investing in adaptation technologies. I wish I could tell you, and I wish that I was an expert in that area. I am not, but I know that it is a direct and deep and active uh, area of research and development right now. The second part of that is right now, if you were to ask, okay, where do we invest these adaptation dollars and all these adaptation technologies and what adaptation technologies need to be developed? The answer is for the most part, a lot of folks don't know. And that is because the data that they need to answer those questions is not accessible to them in the way that they need it. We have invested trillions of dollars at the federal level to collect data from satellites and, and you know, monitors and gauges and everything else. But the people who actually need that information to make really good decisions on impact and vulnerability at the community level, those systems were built in the late 1990s and early 2000s. So part of this entire conversation is also that data infrastructure question. I'm very passionate about that issue. It's a little wonky, I know it is, but that's the beginning, right? If you look at the adaptation cycle, the first is how do we assess the impacts and the vulnerabilities that we have? We gotta have the data to do that. From there, what technologies do we need to develop in order to effectively and efficiently do that, okay? What policies and institutions then need to be put in place to support the implementation of those technologies. That means financing, that means policy, that means budgets, federal budgets, that's what that means, right? And then implementing those technologies in communities so that we can actually um, have the benefit of all that came before it in that cycle, right? That is what that cycle means. Now, do I alone have the answer for how we're gonna solve um, affordable housing and keep energy prices low and do these things, you know, everything on your list? No, I alone do not have those answers, right? But what I do have is deep experience in this space with communities to understand that first, we are not going to see effective progress on those things that you listed out if we don't have communities at the table with us. Everybody has to come along, everybody. Second, we are not gonna do that unless we prioritize our spending and our research and, our, and we use that massive arm of the federal government in order to be able to do the type of large scale infrastructure adaptation that we absolutely must have. If we do not do this and we focus on resilience only, which is recovery, that's like constantly over and over and over again, just putting the Band-Aid on over and over again. It's like only addressing the blood sugar surge and never talking about diabetes. And so we have to have a comprehensive approach to what I'm talking about that includes serious investment, that private partnerships with federal partnerships, empowering state and local communities to do it. And that is quite frankly, the only way forward. I, I mean, I, I'm, I don't know how else to say it. I, I think you just said it. And um, this perfectly dovetails because in the big, large scope of all of the issues, um, the interconnectivity of all of it, the investment in all of it. I love this question from Enzo Cellini. At a high level, can you describe three specific policy initiatives that you would put forth in Congress in support of reducing our carbon emissions? How do you see the role of industry and technology in sustainable energy solutions? So I'll drop that in the chat again for you. But I think uh, that's that's great because um, you know you're in Congress and you're not in charge of like everything, right? <laughs> but you get to introduce bills, and that's how um, the the system works. And so uh, thank you for this question. Three specific policy initiatives. Okay, so first would be uh, 
supporting and subsidizing uh, renewable energies, renewable energy. What this looks like varies based on where you live, right? There are some renewable energy approaches that work in some areas of the country and not others. Uh, so one of the things when people say what policy initiatives, uh, we have to have flexibility in, what, in, that, in whatever that policy initiative is to allow the, uh, the development and support of renewable energy to happen in a way that makes sense. And I think probably at a regional level makes the most sense, right? So that's one. Uh, the other is to you know, end our dependence on uh, fossil fuels. And, and I'm from the South. You know, I don't know how many of you are on this call from the South and particularly from North Carolina, and you remember the battle over reducing tobacco subsidies. We were faced with the, probably the greatest um, healthcare crisis in our nation's history from tobacco use. And how did we then uh, create a system where we had so highly subsidized tobacco farming, right? We have to think about um, how we're going to decouple ourselves from that in a way that is thoughtful of the communities that are the most impacted. So I know in um, West Virginia and Kentucky, and I think Ohio, this is actually happening right now, which is um, bringing back the manufacturing of some of those renewable energy components back to the U.S. So this is a labor question, but it actually supports the initiatives that we're talking about. So they're transitioning these communities that have been coal communities, basically, into being able to produce the parts and the panels for solar for solar. And I think in Ohio, they're already doing it. Susanna, I, I think we, uh, we had that conversation around, I think it's Ohio. So somebody correct me if it's not Ohio, but I think that's where it is. And basically they've created a jobs program, a workforce development program that retrains those who worked in coal to now manufacture uh, solar panels and the components for solar panels. That does a couple of things. It, it again, it, it deals with that issue with transitioning off of fossil fuels and the production of those from, from a community perspective. So, you know, the question is, what do you do about, you know, the communities who are dependent on fossil fuels? And it also helps us with national security and other things um, being less dependent on, you know, our relationship with the Chinese, for example, um, around uh, the production of solar panels and parks, okay? So that kind of workforce development and community investment to help communities that are dependent upon economically on fossil fuel, that's the second policy initiative. Um, the third I would say is, um, and this is one that I want to learn more about it. I've heard a lot about it. I want to learn more about it which is really thinking about how to uh, support um, community solutions. Right now, there is a pushback um, in some communities, not all, about uh, rural electric cooperatives and thinking about uh, how community solar can, um, can, can help communities be more independent. And, um, you know, I will readily admit this is not something that I know, a uh, topic that I know deeply about, but it's something um, that I'm really interested in, in seeing more of the research about and learning more about that. And with support, um, I think those kinds of initiatives, particularly in rural communities um, who tend to have the hardest time recovering um, in the face of an extreme event. Um, so we, we get dual benefit here, right? We reduce carbon emissions. We make communities that are more resilient in the face of an extreme event. And we create a type of um, um, motivation for uh, energy companies to then get there. It helps them actually build their uh, renewable energy portfolio by using community solar. So those are just three things off the top of my head, but um, but I'm, uh, I am a person who believes in listening and thinking about innovative solutions um, from communities. So if there were to be something that someone put forward, um, I would definitely be opening to hear other options too. But those are the three that I think right now that I can come up with. 
Well, I appreciate that. And Olivia Ward had asked, what do you think is one of the biggest political issues in your district? And I think that that's what's what you just dovetailed, right? Like what we need for the world and what what's going on in North Carolina District 6 that you think really rises to the surface? Um, okay, so I think it's hard to do to talk about one uh, issue. Uh, so let's see, just a quick, some quick things that I think everybody's worried about inflation right now. I think everybody's really worried about um, the cost of everything and uh, how far their dollar is going. So inflation is something that, you know, people are very concerned about and rightfully so. I think when we think about the causes of inflation, how long it's, it's going to go on, um, there is no doubt that the COVID ep, um, pandemic is certainly the root of a lot of what we're seeing and interruptions in global supply chains, along with then a, a revamping up of our uh, economy uh, to uh, people start buying. And then, you know, the, the supply chain to be able to meet that demand is certainly part of it. Um, so how do you address inflation. And of course, the president has um, has already done some things to try and address inflation, like particularly with gas prices, sort of um, releasing oil from our oil release. Um, he's increased the hours of operations at different ports. He's incentivized corporations to move their goods away from ports fast enough. But I think there are other things we can do too. Um, that does, don't maybe seem to be related, but they are like an immigration policy that would alleviate some of our labor shortage. I mean, wow, wouldn't that be great, right? Um, you know, easing the tariffs. The Biden administration has not yet eased the tariffs that were originally put on um, by the on by the Trump administration. So, I mean, that's something that I think we should definitely do. Um, you know, really thinking about our ag and food production. Um, you know, I'm I'm one of the things that disturbs me about what's happening with um, the current topic about inflation is some of it is inflation. Corporations have just announced a 70 year record profit. So how do those two things live together, right? How do we have both inflation like we're having and record profits from corporations? I call that price gouging, not inflation. So I think one of the things we need to do is really think about companies that are using this moment to pass on, to take this opportunity to uh, really grow their profit margins by raising their prices where they don't need to. And that's, that's a regulatory um, oversight issue, that antitrust issue that the federal government needs to get their hands around. And we're not right now, and we should. Um, things like, I was talking about solar production, um, but manufacturing other things like the microchips and things that we need for automobiles and other things, bringing those things back to the U.S. That's a long-term solution, but that is certainly one of them. So inflation is an issue that I think I often hear people talk about. Housing is another issue people in this district always are talking about. And, um, you know, that that is hard from a federal level because a lot of housing policies are set actually at the state and local level. But there are a few things that I think that could happen at the federal level um, that maybe alleviate some of the affordable housing crisis that we're seeing in this district. Um, for example, incentivizing multifamily housing by making it a criteria in these enormous federal grants that communities get. Um, the federal government sends millions, billions of dollars down to states and communities all the time. And uh, one of the ways in which you can incentivize state and local governments to to do things differently is to um, add a line in those requirements that say require a certain percentage of their development to be multifamily housing. So that's that's one idea. Um, I'm not a housing expert, but that's certainly something I think sounds like a good idea. Um, I'd be willing to hear someone who doesn't think it's a good idea. Things like um, universalizing Section 8 housing, super controversial, but I'd really be opening open to hearing more about it. And um, I think that's an approach that the federal government could take. Um, but one thing I think really we should think about, particularly in this district, why did Durham develop like it did? Historic credits, historic tax credits. They were fundamental in the revitalization of Durham that happened 
that asset-based economic development strategy that has been so incredibly successful in Durham was built upon, foundational to that, meaning they could not get anyone to invest in Durham until they had them historic tax credits, which alleviated the tax burden of developers by something like 40%. Would they restore historic buildings rather than tearing them down and build new buildings? We need something like that for developers for affordable housing. Now, maybe it exists and I just don't know about it, but that's we need that kind of federal policy tax incentive so that people are develop, have the incentive to develop multifamily housing and affordable housing. And so there's, housing is a big issue here. Inflation, housing, I could go on and on. There's a lot of issues, but I think those are two that I really hear a lot of, uh, that are not sort of on those priority issues list that we're already talking about. I really hear a lot of conversation about those things locally. Yeah, and I love that you say you hear, which means that you listen. Um, it's really exciting. So uh, we recognize we're at the top of the hour. We did set aside an hour and a half because we wanted to get to everybody's questions. We hope people are going to be able to stay on. Um, and we also are recording this, so you will receive a copy of that. So don't leave us just yet, because as much as we're talking about um, the policies and the solutions and the money, we also know so much of this work is about relationships. And right now we're going to do a little bit of a marketing commercial because we do need you. You are our relationships. The fact that you're spending this time with us tonight means everything. And I'm going to be really candid in saying that um, Ashley Ward is not a household name yet. Okay. And we do need your help to make that. So when people have been in the political space, people are more familiar with, oh, I've heard of that person. I've heard of that person. Well, a prof professor at Duke University in the area of climate and health science and environmental data collection <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that she has a household name. And yet it's such a beautiful name. And we want this name to be recognized everywhere. So Ashley, just briefly share how people can get involved in the campaign. Okay, thank you. Um, so first you can visit my website. And when you go to my website, you can sign up to get on our mailing list and then you will receive updates. I try not to I will be honest, I'm really careful and respectful of your email inboxes. There is nothing that irritates me more than a political candidate sending me an email every single day about a different topic. I, so I really try not to hit your inbox more than a couple times a week. Okay, so I promise I'll respect your inbox. Um, but uh, signing up for the mailing list so that you can keep up with what's going on with the campaign. Um, also, we have uh, lots of volunteer opportunities with the campaign, and we need everybody. I mean, let's be honest, what wins a campaign in a district like ours is ground game, and that is getting my name out to people in the communities in the neighborhood. So what does that look like? Um, phone banking. Uh, we are going to be hosting some phone banking sessions where you can come and we'll either do them on Zoom, depending on COVID, we'll do them on Zoom or we'll do them in person and come and make phone calls to people who are already Democrats. We're, we're targeting Democrats. This is a primary for Democrats. So I don't want you to worry about, you know, calling someone who might be, you know, a little more aggressive with you because they're they're not like-minded. So you're most you're calling like-minded individuals and saying, hey, just want to let you know about this candidate. And you know, here's your early voting dates and here's where you need to go vote for your, uh, it's, it's really not hard. I'm gonna be honest. I've phone banked so much. It's my favorite things to do. Uh, and because I love talking to people and uh, it's really, it's really a wonderful experience. Um, I tend to not hit as many phone numbers as other people because I get on the phone with people and then I end up talking to them and learn about their dog and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it's a lot of fun. Um, the other thing is writing postcards. Uh, we are going to be sending out postcards to people, as many people in the district as we can right before early voting starts so that they know where they need to go to early vote and tell them a little bit about me. So they have my name in front of them and they have where they go to early vote. So you can do that while you're sitting and watching TV at night um, and just let us know. We give you the script. We give you the list of addresses and you just write the postcards. And if you would like, we would really appreciate it if you would buy the postcard stamp and put it on them and then just give them back to us. We will take care of mailing them right before early voting starts. Yard signs. I'll get back to yard signs in a minute, but we need everybody to put a yard sign in their yard. And if you know all of your friends to put a yard sign in their yard, uh, Doug Jones won Alabama with yard signs. I mean, that's what the research says. And it's really, that is an endorsement. That's, that's, 
that means more than a TV commercial and a billboard. A yard sign is my friend, my neighbor, this person I respect is, is, in, is supporting this candidate. So I'm going to look at them seriously. Yard signs are super important. And we, we've got our first batch of yard signs coming in in just a couple of weeks. And we need people to put, not only put them in their yard, but help us deliver them to everybody else who wants one. Uh, literature drops. I see a couple of names on this list who have already done literature drops with me. They are so much fun. Again, this is no contact. We are literally just hanging a postcard on a person's door, doorknob, so that they get my name and they uh, they see me when they come home on their <laughs> that information and it gives them a link. You know, they can go to my website and learn more about me. I want you all to know that the last lit drops we did, I had over 300 hits to my website within the next 24 hours. Lit drops work and it takes a lot of feet on the ground to do it. It only takes about two hours, two hours once a week. That's all I'm asking you for. And you can sign up to do lit drops at this link that's right here at the bottom. And you're going, you all are going to get this PowerPoint slide. So you'll get all these links on your own and then host an event. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute too. And of course, the conversation we all hate to have, which is grassroots fundraising. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the folks in this campaign are career politicians. Matter of fact, I'm the only one who hasn't won a political campaign before. I'm the only newbie in the group. Uh, if you've run a political campaign before, or if you're currently in public office, you can roll over funds from your previous campaign into this one. So a lot of the, uh, the folks that I'm running against in this primary, they started with you know, a, a small, or some of them a big, war chest already. And they have a national campaign and a fundraising infrastructure. I've spent my career building my expertise, not a political fundraising infrastructure. So every little bit counts. It depends, it, fundraising means I can buy yard signs. It means maybe I can put banners up in certain places or billboards that I can buy those postcards for you to write on that the, you know, to give you an idea, the management software, just so we can get all the voter information and figure out where to go and do lit drops and all that kind of stuff, it's $1,000 a month. Uh, so you know those kinds of expenses are important to a campaign so that we can do our lit drops. And then of course my campaign staff, I have a tiny campaign staff too. And everybody else is a volunteer in my campaign. And I have such loyal people that are willing to spend their time with me, but I need to be able to pay those people who are campaign staff and pay them a fair wage to do it. And that depends upon donations. So $30, $50, $100, it really goes a long way in a campaign like mine. It really does. So if you can donate, uh, uh, there's the link on this page. I'll send it to you. I would really appreciate it. House parties, these can be virtual like this right here. My campaign has a Zoom account and I can get on a Zoom call with you and your friends. And there could sometimes it's just six people. It's awesome, we have a great time. We drink coffee, whatever, we have a glass of wine, we talk, it's fun. Sometimes it's 20 people, you know, um, gets a little crazier. Um, sometimes they're in person, everybody's worried about COVID. And as we, as COVID gets a little bit more under control and the weather gets nicer, maybe you're, you, you, maybe you're willing to have some friends over to your patio and uh, we'll stand outside and, and, and talk. Hosting a house party uh, doesn't have to be fancy, right? It can be just uh, some cheese and crackers and a beverage for people. Uh, lemonade tea, you know, and we'll just stand around and let your friends have a chance to meet me. House parties are a great way to get the word out about me and a great way for people just to have access to me. Um, and yard signs. Here are my yard signs. They will be here in a couple of weeks. There's a link here and there's a link at the very top of my webpage. You click on it at the very, the banner at the very top. You go in and you fill out the form that tells me you want a yard sign. And there's a little box at the bottom that says, you'll also help me deliver yard signs. And when we get these yard signs in by the end of the month, I wanna see my yard signs all over this district and everybody's yard. So I really hope that you'll uh, consider signing up for a yard sign and helping me distribute yard signs. Okay, Susanna, I did it.
I'm so proud of you. That is hard to do. And this is like one of the things that gives me courage every day. The more that I volunteer and spend time with you, Ashley, is like reminds me that like we are the ones that we seek. What are we waiting for? Like our time is now. And um, I know how hard it is to ask for money. I know how hard it is. I mean, we're givers, right? We're doers and givers. And um, and and actually we all need help. And <laughs> this is our time to model what that looks like too, is to, is to really give what we can in our time, talent, and treasure. So anything any of you can do, just the fact that you're giving us your time tonight, asking these great questions um, and going back to the questions, because I love the questions that came in in um, earlier. And I'm going to, I'm going to put these together because they go really nicely together. Um, and I love the people that ask them. So John Locke and Virginia LeBaron uh, say from two Virginians, how do you envision working with your congressional colleagues to effectively implement positive change, especially given the divisive political climate? And I'm going to dovetail that with Brad Wood's fabulous question of, I'm liking, well, first a statement, I'm liking everything you've shared tonight, he says. If the current stalemate we see in DC continues to play out, we won't see action on anything related to climate, healthcare and housing without Republicans also fully backing it. How will you work with Republicans to reconsider their current positions and advance the solutions you're sharing? So I'm going to drop what John and Virginia wrote first um, as folks that are um, calling in from another state. Thank you for being here. Again, encourage your friends and family all over the country to become aware of Ashley's campaign. And so you can start there. And then I'm going to drop Brad's question in afterwards so you can dovetail these together. Oh, you're talking about the story of my life, my career. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard to do. It takes an incredible amount of patience, a lot of listening. <clears throat> um, so you're right to be worried about the political climate. I think that is worrisome for all of us. Uh, we've all just been through a very disappointing uh, battle over voting rights. Um, what I will tell you is what I have learned in my community work. That's the only way I know to answer this question. And that is, you are correct. There is no progress if we don't bring everybody along. Uh, and, and more importantly, there's no sustainable progress if we don't bring everybody along. And that is a big difference between doing something right now in the moment where we get something because we have the votes and making sure that it is sustainable and long-term so that it doesn't get flipped over the next time somebody else is in power, right? So uh, you are correct to be concerned about that. How I have dealt with that in communities. Um, well, first of all, um, there's a lot of relationship building. People are not willing to trust someone they do not know. And a lot of people have sort of lamented the culture right now of Congress um, where people are, um, uh, people are, oh, I just see the question, how would you work with Madison Cawthorn? Okay, so let me just put a caveat to what I've been talking about. Um, there are more people that are not like Madison Cawthorn than Madison Cawthorns in Congress. I know it doesn't seem that way to us because Madison Cawthorn and Marjorie Taylor Greene, they get all the news but those are small number. I am never going to change Madison Cawthorn's mind. I'm never gonna change Marjorie Taylor Greene's mind. My goal is to target those who are willing to work with, uh, with me, build a relationship with those people. Sometimes it looks like looking at them and saying, what is it gonna to take to bring you on board? And then you be quiet and you let them answer. And then once we have their answer, we get to decide whether or not what we do with that answer, right? Are we willing to go meet them where they are? Maybe we're not. A lot of these things just take persistence, time, relationship building. That's what it takes. I agree with you though. It is necessary, not for everything. There are some things I gotta be, I gotta be honest with you. Things like voting rights, 
we don't wait till we have everybody on board. Things like ethical government, we don't wait till we have everybody on board. We get the votes, we pass them. When we don't, when we can't do that, we have to do that hard grinding work that I was just describing that I have done for my entire career in communities with people who really don't like each other. Um, and I don't know any other magic way to do it. It is really just about doing the hard work. That's frustrating. I feel like I just took a pause there in prayer and blessings for, for all, all those that are called into public service, especially in government. And um, gosh, we do know where we're at in this time in North Carolina is like so critical in relationship to the future of democracy. We often say that as the South leads, so the country follows and, um, and everything that's happening here. I, I do think it's interesting. Um, and as the questions, um, we, we are willing to, you know, be online. So continue to ask questions, get to know Ashley. Um, you know, you got any other personal questions or anything? I mean, you just hit on something that is so deeply emotional, I think, for all of us and, and how interesting it is for those of us on this call that happen to live in North Carolina District 6, right? This is considered to be a guaranteed blue seat. And I think it's really, really interesting um, the role that that seat plays in a state like North Carolina. And, um, and I'm glad, thank you for asking that question about Madison Cawthorn, because what an anomaly. I mean, that's not the, you know, it's sort of the extreme example of, um, of what we're up against. And yet we know that there's so many good people out there that have just given up on our government. And as an environmentalist and someone who works in the environmental arena, as do you, um, I am appalled by the data that shows that environmentalists are some of the um, historically worst voters that we do not turn out, that we, we don't walk our walk in a lot of places. And um, so until another question comes in and, um, and I, I can come up with a million questions Actually, for you all. I'm surprised one topic that hasn't come up is rural broadband. Oh, well, and that fits perfectly with regards to the conversation around access to information, right? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. And you brought up electric co-ops already. What yeah. a great way to expand broadband, but I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I don't know if it's because a lot of people, there may not be a lot of folks here that live in rural communities that have an issue with access, you know, but in the Northern part of our district, for sure, it is a major ordeal. And I think, you know, COVID just highlighted the importance of something like rural broadband, that kind of data infrastructure that we need, um, because it, it, it's not just about being able to go on Amazon and buy what you want. I mean, clearly it's about being able to do telehealth appointments for your kids to be able to go to school and do online learning. I teach an online course for a very rural community college in Eastern North Carolina. I do that on the side in addition to my other full-time job and now running for Congress. Why do I do that? I do that because, um, well, rural communities need good teachers too. And uh, I have students in that class who are taking exams and writing papers on their mobile phones. I think that's horrific. And through COVID, I certainly couldn't back out of that. Uh, you know, I've been doing it for a long time now. The school reached out to me because they were desperate. They were going to have to cancel classes and not teach them. And they absolutely needed somebody to do it. My husband couldn't do it. And so he said, hey, my wife is qualified. This was many, many years ago. And I agreed to step in and do it. And I've been doing it. And I, you know, um, I continue to do it because until they get someone that can uh, full time, I will continue to help them out in any way I can. But it really highlighted for me 
the digital divide, right? And the, in the, the problem with rural broadband for education. But think about small businesses. How many people start a small business in their house? How many people these days can do the, you know, the gig economy and everything else? You know, they need internet access. Um, and, you know, having to drive your kid to the local um, Ruatan club to do school during the day is not going to get it. That's not a functional solution for what's happening in rural communities. And so rural broadband, in my opinion, is the classic public good issue, right? There's not enough demand signal for the private and in, uh, industry to invest, right? Um, however, there's a major need for it. And so that means that in order to deal with that, there has to be federal and state um, investment there. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to get there, but there's one policy thing that I think needs to change, and that is amending uh, section 254 of the Communications Act to remove the word reasonably. Right now in that act, it says that services that are reasonably comparable to rural and urban areas. Okay, what that means though, is that you know four megabytes per second is considered reasonable to a gig, uh, to, uh, to a gigabit in urban space. That's not reasonable. So we have to remove that out of that requirement so that federal and state agencies have to actually spend the public's money on services that are affordable and comparable to our rural areas. And so that, that to me is a, is a really huge thing. Another thing that we see in the Build Back Better plan, I think actually in, no, I take that back. I think it's in the infrastructure bill, which is money going only to long-term solutions. I think that this is important because a lot of time, you know, it's the private industry's role to take risk, right? And, and be innovative and take risks like that. Public agencies are very risk averse. It's the public agencies need to invest and uh, long-term proven assets, right? And around this issue. And that, I mean, things that are feasible for 30 years, that's what that means. So let the private sector take, take risk if it wants to, but with less stable technology, but we need investments from the federal and state level um, in order to invest in the kind of infrastructure we need to address rural broadband. Um, and so, I'm. You know, I know that that didn't come up among the questions among folks here, but I cannot emphasize enough all of my work in rural communities and, and myself living in a rural community, having grown up in a rural community. Um, the truth is Democrats have ignored rural communities for far too long. And uh, when it comes to climate change, they have the most to lose. Uh, and um, Democrats need to re-engage in rural communities. Our, our policies serve rural communities effectively, more effectively, right? And there's no reason um, that we can't be active in those communities too. Well, you're getting accolades in the chat for bringing and raising up the issues of rural broadband. Um, there's so much that you said there that resonates um, so much truth and justice and equity and inclusion in your message. I'm just, I'm so grateful. And I know that we're about to, to wrap it up here. I'm gonna give anybody, um, you know, I feel like uh, I should have had that rapid fire, you know, uh, those questions that on all the talk shows where I ask you, you know, what, <laughs> what your favorite sandwich is and are you a lake person, a beach person or a mountain person? Tomato, beach. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do more of that. And that's the kind of thing that I want to do when I have my wine and divine party. I have decided I'm going to call it a goddess party. And I want all my girlfriends to come and um, get to know you. And then I'll do one for the guys, all of my husband, and then we'll do a group. Um, you know, I want to have multiple house parties and also Zoom works. Like it's okay to have host a host house party on Zoom and invite your friends and be able to, um, get folks to meet Ashley. And it doesn't have to be a whole hour and a half. What we wanted to do tonight was launch what we conceived as a very first sort of public town hall, right? Um, you know, to, to get, I, I'm looking at the list of names and participants and I know some of you, but not all of you. I wanna know all of you. And that's 
a real community space of, of building that power from the grassroots up. Um, and so if, imagine if each one of you um, invited three people, we'd have, you know, that many more people exponentially, and then those people and those people and those people. So be thinking creatively and be thinking in a fun, exciting way about what it means. Um, again, it gets, it gives me like butterflies in my stomach that I would like personally know someone in Washington, DC representing me, hearing my voice. I know I would have way less access to you because I know what happens is that I wouldn't just be able to text you and you'd immediately text me back. But oh, the I idea would. I would, Susanna. <laughs> no, you would. That's why you on the on the call list, right? Instead of the hundred that you get to, you get to five because you do know the dog's names and the cat's names and what time they <laughs> during the day. Um, so I would like to give you the final um the final words and um and we just want to hear from you ashley we're all here for you that's why we came tonight um we appreciate we're going to send out a packet of resources including this recording uh to everyone who registered for this call we had uh gosh it was it was a lot of people um i know we had about a third of the people that showed up um which is actually really high in zoom land right now of those who register because people have dinner plans and are putting kids to bed right now um and watching um you know netflix or i was actually glad that amy lost last night on jeopardy because i was worried that she was gonna be on the show tonight i was gonna be watching this and i was like oh good i can do this without having to worry about what's happening on jeopardy and, you know all this stuff life is so real and we need to make this campaign as real as possible because you are real and I just I love you I'm a proud of you I'm here for you and um, uh, take us out tonight Ashley oh thank you I mean gosh Suzanne I don't know <laughs> thank you all for coming it really means so much I mean there there were almost 80 people signed up for this um, zoom and I think that's phenomenal um, you know and um, thank you all so much for coming and for a great conversation and for your support and you know Honestly, I just look forward to talking to all of you and getting to know all of you. I really believe that community comes first. It means I have to build the community and um, I'm working hard at it. And I can only say, I know I'm asking you to do something different. I know I am. I know this is not the typical way to do things. Like, you know, I, you know I'm supposed to be a, some kind of public official before I do this. I'm asking you to take a chance on someone. Um, and I, I appreciate, I would really appreciate you doing that. And I can only say that um, you decide to do that, right? And trust me with your vote. I can only promise that I would work my hardest every single day um, on your behalf. And um, I am committed to this district. I am a daughter of this district. I grew up here. Um, my children are here. Um, I want this district. And in fact, I want our world, our nation and our world to succeed in addressing some of these major problems. And, um, you know, I'm a fighter. I can promise you that, uh, you know, one good thing about me not being a career public official is um, I'm willing to take the bold steps. I don't define myself by only being a public official. I have a career too. And uh, that means that I'm willing to push and fight. I am not complacent. I am not willing to go with the status quo. And that is what it's going to take. Bold, brave action. I will do that if I get there, but I'm asking you to do the same now and vote for me. Well, there we have it. Vote for Ashley Ward. Have that be on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> I love it. Kate says they all they say all politics are local, but these days all politics are also global. Thank you. And um, there's been some great comments. We're so, so grateful to all of you for coming. Spread the word. Vote for Ashley Ward. Vote for Ashley Ward. So goodbye to everyone. Um, I will say that Enzo came in with a last minute question. Uh, and as I said, great question. If you stay on the Zoom after the, we close, I know Ashley will stay on to answer. She's that kind of person here for all of us. 
So um, everyone else is free to head out, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, stay with us, stay on board, put a sign in your yard, order 10 more, have a house party. Let's do this. I believe that we will win. So thanks <laughs> for coming and um, yeah, be well, stay, stay, stay healthy, safe and strong. Um, and thanks. <laughs>